Welcome to Creativity, the podcast where art and engineering collide. My name is Max Maker and this is my co-host, Jeremy S. Cook. Hey guys, today we have a couple special guests on today, Steve and Alex, who are building a boat. How, so how are you guys doing? Doing great. Yeah, doing very well. Thank you. So, um, you know, I say building a boat, that's a little, maybe a little bit of a um, understatement. Can you tell us about your, your big project that you're working on? Uh, I mean, no, that's totally accurate. We are building a boat. Uh, it's a 38-foot Akin Ingrid, so it's a catch rig double under. Uh, she'll displace 25,000 pounds dry and empty when uh, the boat's done. It's 38 feet on deck, 32 on the water line with an 11 four-foot beam. Uh, it'll displace about 25,000 pounds, I think I said that, and um, she'll draft about five foot six. And we started by going out in the woods, firing up the chainsaw, cutting down the trees, milling the lumber, scavenging the lead, pouring the ballast keel. Um, everything that we've done, it's been on basically a shoestring budget, and it's the first time we've ever done anything like this. So we're very much uh, <laughs> learning on the fly. We did a a ton of research before we started, and we do a ton of research almost every day. So, so you said it drafts five six. That's fairly shallow for the kind of boat you're describing, right? Or am I am I wrong about that? Um, no, you're not wrong. Um, so it's a heavy displacement full keel, so it doesn't have a fin or anything underneath it that increase the draft. Uh, okay. So it's very flat bottomed. And one of the advantages with a boat like that is you can actually beach her, um, which is oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah, many of the yeah. newer style boats or a lot of the fiberglass boats have longer keels that reach down to kind of compensate for the weight. Okay. But obviously they're faster, right? Yeah, they're faster. Mm -hmm. They point higher into the wind. They're lighter. Um, this is your old style cruising boat. So it's based off of the Colin Archer designs and he was a naval architect like way back in the day. Um, I think he was originally from Ireland and his work is famous in Norway and he designed um, their lifeboats. Um, so these were gaff rigged boats that went out in the North Sea when all of the other boats were sinking to go rescue them. Uh, and Akin um, came across these style of boats and then refined them a little bit more for cruising and a little less for lifesaving. Uh, and that's where the kind of the boat's heritage is from. Yeah. And William Akin is from uh, Darien, Connecticut. So fairly close to where we are actually right now. Okay. And you say, you say gaff rigged. What do you, what do you mean by that exactly? Oh, yes. First of all, is this a sailing ship or a, um, what, what, what powers this boat? I guess that's maybe the big, yeah, it's the first a sailboat. Question. Sailboat. Okay. Yeah. I should have then, a uh, diesel auxiliary, but the, the sails are really the main power mm -hmm. plant. So the rig okay. is basically the sail type. So our boat is a catch, which means it's got the two masts. Um, and then the typical sailboat that most people think of is, um, is a Marconi rig, which basically is a big triangular sail. The gaffs right. are the ones that have that little boom up at the top that make it more of a sort of uh, kind of a more rectangular sail. Oh, okay. So like, like, like you would think it was a uh, pirate ship or something, right? Is that? <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> Jeremy, this is a difficult, uh, a dangerous discussion because there's so many details to know about rigs. Yeah. Like we could talk <laughs> about this for hours. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a good point. I, I had a, um, a whole, or a, I say Hopi cat, but a, a Prindle for a short time and ended up never sunk it, sunk it. So that was, <laughs> that's about the <laughs> extent of my, uh, sailing expertise, I guess. That's good. It's uh, more than we got. Oh, seriously. You guys have never, you guys, so, so you guys are really starting from scratch. Is that? Absolutely. Yeah. So neither of you, before you started this, you, neither of you had sailed a, uh, a boat or ship or anything like, like that. Yeah, I mean, Steve has never been on a sailing ship, which I think is an awesome part of the story. And I'm going to keep it that way <laughs> until the end of the story. <laughs> um, and I've been sailing a couple of times, um, but honestly don't have all that much experience. But the idea of building our own ship and for, I mean, everything that we hear is the first time you go sailing is just magical. And the first time you sail your own boat is magical. So to be able to have Steve do that on both, would be <laughs> fantastic. I've already lost my opportunity, so that's totally fine with me, but it's part of the You part know, of experience. when I was around 18, I sailed a lot at school because uh, we live near the coast and we had like some sailing projects. And then I decided I want to buy my own boat. 
first, first I just drove around on kayaks with, with my buddy and every summer we went somewhere on the Baltic Sea with the kayaks and then we thought, man, if we had a sail, it would be so much easier. <laughs> um, and then I decided to buy a little boat. It was just uh, 18 feet, so there's five meters. So it's a little bit less than half of your boat for those that live in Europe and don't know what all these feet are about. And when, when we <laughs> sailed with it, I, I realized straight away, oh crap, this is, this is not good. Like it was so shaky. We got, uh, really seasick. It was always a mess, uh, down below deck because it was so small that you couldn't really organize anything. You could just throw it through the hatch onto the inside. Mm -hmm. And in the very first summer, uh, like I launched it in about, um, Easter time. And by the end of the summer, I already sold it on because I realized <laughs> I didn't like this whole sailing thing that much. <laughs> like I enjoyed building it up and uh, fixing everything and getting the equipment ready and reading about it. But the actual sailing wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. I, are you afraid about that? Uh, you might not actually enjoy going around the world with it. No. <laughs> hmm. uh, you, you have no, no fear of that. That's, that's interesting. So you're, you set that you're going to be a sailor the first time you jump on. It's just going to. Not necessarily. I mean, it's, for us, it's more the lifestyle that it would bring. And sailing is just all part of the kinds of stuff that we enjoy doing. I'm not too worried about trying to figure out what that's going to be like, because I have a feeling we'll take up to it fairly easily. Wow, that, that's... That's, that's such a big confidence, that's such a big commitment for like, but that, that's awesome though. So, well, so how in, far oh, in ahead. the long run, even if, you know, even if we don't like it at the end, we have this huge thing that we built that if we do decide to sell, which is absolutely not in our plans right now. I mean, that's, that's also an option. Yeah. I mean, very true. You always have the value of the boat, especially if it's new. So, and well built uh, and it looks like you really do all the right decisions and always the perfect decisions you know you don't cut any corners Not, nothing is perfect <laughs> <laughs> no of course but like uh so many details that you look um I, when i watch your videos i noticed that you look at all these details and say oh this didn't work out in the past so we are going to do it the right way yeah i mean as much as we can um the i don't know a wooden bow is it really ultimately is going to come down to the maintenance of the vessel so you can build it you know, phenomenally well. And if you don't take care of it, it's going to fall apart real quick and you can build it kind of shoddily. And if you take phenomenal care of it, it'll probably last. Um, so for us with, you know, the places we plan to go and the things we plan to do, and we plan to own the boat for the rest of our lives, we're really trying to set it up so that the boat requires as little maintenance and work as possible um, during the time that we have her and that any of that work and maintenance is as easy as possible to do. So that was one of the real things we learned with Victoria is that to fix anything, you had to take a lot of things apart and they were not easy to take apart. Um, so the natural inclination then is to just not fix things. <laughs> Victoria so was Victoria us. is the other boat that you take apart, uh, you salvage for scrap, right? Yeah, exactly. That was a boat that we had found down on the coast that is was basically exactly the same thing we're building just six feet shorter <laughs> and, and and why did you buy that or did you did you get it for free because you said you found it um i mean we didn't find it necessarily somebody pointed it out to us it was on craigslist uh there was a gentleman by the name of bruce that had kind of saved her from her demise mm. uh, she had been abandoned at a marina and was going to get basically destroyed and ripped apart for parts and all her bronze parts were going to be sold off and he kind of has a sweet spot for wooden boats although he did not have the <laughs> capability of fixing them but he kind of kept her limping along until we came across his ad and um at first he was looking for somebody to restore her and we let him know we we're like look that's that's definitely not us we are not looking to restore another boat um but we are building a very similar boat and we'd be very happy to gently take her apart and use as much as we possibly can to kind of put into our new build and so she was, uh, it, that seemed like a good option. He wasn't so excited about that at first, but we told him, you know, do your due diligence, go see if you can find somebody that can, uh, that wants to restore her and get back to us if you can't. And so about a month <laughs> later, he contacted us and said, well, you guys might as well come out and take a look. 
And as soon as we got out there, we saw she was just completely encrusted in beautiful bronze parts, but she was in rough shape. Um, <laughs> so he was actually asking for $3,000 for the boat, knowing full well that there was a lot more worth in her. Um, and he just wanted it to go to a good home. So oh, that's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we're about a hundred miles from the ocean. Um, so we needed to figure out how to get her trucked over here. And he basically just said, you know, figure out how much that's going to cost. And, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. And we're like, well, okay, you know, how much do you want? And, you know, we'll give you the 3000. He goes, Oh no, 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 that's, that's way too much. Find out and come back to me and we'll talk. <laughs> so in the long run, it was about $1,200 to get her shipped here. And oh wow! when we let him know, he was like, okay, well, how do you guys feel about giving me another 1200 bucks? And we're like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Looks like the community really is getting together on building the ship. Yeah, I mean, it has from the get-go. Uh, the amount of help that we've received is, has really been tremendous. And yeah. I mean, at first, there was definitely a little bit of the skepticism from folks. Like, you guys are going to do <laughs> what? Um, but as things went and as we really, I don't know, kind of showed that we weren't going to give up and that we actually had the capabilities to pull this off, um, the more people I think realize that this actually could be a reality, the, the more they got behind it. Um, I forget who we were talking to, but they told us about this joke or comedy skit. I'm not really sure where it originated, but the idea is that there's this guy who's got just a really crappy car and he's got to go on the highway every day. And this is like pre cell phones and, uh, his car breaks down all the time. And he finds if he sits in the car with the hood up, nobody stops. If he gets out and opens up the hood and like pretends like he knows what he's looking at under the hood, somebody might stop and offer their help. And if the guy gets out of the car and starts pushing it down the highway, multiple people will stop and help. And it's that kind of thing where you're like, oh, they're on the side of the road. They'll be okay. Like, oh, they'll figure it out. But when you're like that crazy SOB is going to kill himself pushing that car down the road, I have to help him. <laughs> um, so we definitely had some kind of that help come through, especially with like Peter loaning us the log skitter to do the second round of logging. He's like, you you did all of this with a farm tractor? Like you you realize people die doing this with farm tractors, right? He's like, I, I can't have this on my conscious. Like I'll drop off my log skitter. Let me know when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> but I think people need to see you out there pushing the car. And if they see you out there, like really going for broke, they'll, they'll step up and they'll help. And that, that's totally been our experience. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes, makes total sense. Um, I see a lot of similarities here to the SV Seeker build. Yeah, in certain ways, definitely. Oh, even just that you're inland, both of you. For those uh, listeners that don't know, SV Seeker is like a YouTube channel where he builds, it's basically like Akon to Arabella just with one guy and he's building a steel boat. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> but, but your boat is really big as well. I mean, compared to most of the ships that we have here in Germany, it's bigger than the average boat, definitely. I think for... Uh kind of cruising vessel it's not that big For here most boat, boats are like uh, nine meters nine to ten meters and you are the 11 i think so yeah so there's a difference between uh sailboats that are meant for kind of coastal cruising compared to blue water sailboats which are meant to go for long distances well that makes and makes and, sense and where do you plan to go oh <laughs> At least around the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, Wh we've which got, way around? Got, ah, doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. <laughs> <laughs> we've got places we want to see and things we want to do that are scattered all over the globe. So it's just easy for us to say go sail around the world. Um, it probably will not be a straight shot. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, that kind of brings me to uh, another question I have. Are, are you guys like married, have kids, uh, any commitments like that? Or is it pretty much, it's pretty much uh, just now, wondering what, what the people in your life think about this if they. Uh... Well, when I started, the I was single and my only real commitments were the dog and the chickens. And we ate the chickens and I still have the dog. Um, that's so good. that's about that. <laughs> And uh, I actually, I quit my job. I was working uh, up in Portland, Maine when we started the project. And I had a girlfriend at the time, but I got into the project and God bless her. She she tried, she came down and it just wasn't for her. So she uh, 
we, we ended up splitting up. Oh, that's, but that's now you've got half sad. a boat, so. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's not necessarily sad. I mean, everybody's got their own path, and it wasn't necessarily what she wanted to do. And I, I give her full credit for understanding that and knowing that and following her own dreams. Oh, fair enough. Well, at least the dog's still around, right? So yeah. that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, so earlier we talked about uh, the, the plans for the ship or the type of the ship from all the kind of ships that you could have built. Why exactly this one or how did you find this one? Mm. So when I was looking at boats to build, um, I realized it was very much like if you were going to go build a car and you had every model make and manufacturer of every car throughout the entirety of history to choose from. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much like the scope that we're talking about, except boats existed for thousands of years before cars. So there's, I, there's just uh, an insane amount of options. Um, and what I kind of realized was that my better bet was to pick a designer and then pick a boat out of that designer's repertoire. So instead of trying to find a specific boat, I started to try to find a specific designer. And that definitely narrows the pool. Um, so I looked at Harishoff, Alden, Bueller, Akin, Sparkman Stevens, you know, all the usuals. Um, and Akin is one that just kind of kept popping up here and there. And they had a, you know, from my readings, they had a really good reputation for just straightforward seaworthy vessels, whether it was a dinghy or a skiff or a motor runabout or a blue water cruiser that, They were just basically no frills, go out there, have a good time, come back safely, boats. And Atkins' motto, tagline, I don't know whatever you want to call it, is, um, I don't know if this is quite exactly right, but it'll get you the gist. It's um, customized designs for unregimented yachtsmen or something like that. And I was like, <laughs> unregimented yachtsmen, like that Definitely is that yachts. is us. Um, that is also SV Sika. Yeah. yeah. So... <laughs> Atkins thing was they, they wanted to design boats for the amateur home builder to build at home. Um, so in general, they're overbuilt. The scantilings are huge. Uh, most of the designs don't have any like crazy shape to them. Um, either if, you know, if you're a first time builder, they're a, they're a great choice. So after I read that and kind of dug more into Atkin, um, I was like, all right. And, I think an Akin would be a good choice. And then I started looking through their designs more. Um, and when I came across Ingrid is what Akin calls her. Uh, I was like, that's it. That's the boat. Um, and then we ordered the plans and went from there. Where, where do you, where do you get plans like this? You said, do people actually have a, just a catalog, I guess. Or? Yeah. So the plans for Akin, um, the current curator is Pat Akin. I'm not, exactly sure what her uh, relationship is to the um to the drawers uh it was a father and son um but she has all the plans in connecticut and they are all you know available for sale so if you go to the akin website you can look through all the boats um i think the plans for the boat were like two or three hundred dollars like pretty cheap. yeah considering the expense of building a boat they're a drop in the bucket um, i wonder how many sure. buy the buy the plans and never finish their boats I think most oh, people that, that buy the plans the never build the boats. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you have any idea how many of these boats people actually built? Uh, quite a few. I had no idea of an exact number, but we've been contacted by people all over the world who have known someone who's built them and circumnavigated on them. Um, we know a couple people who own <clears> one. Um, and they were built, a fiberglass version was mm -hmm. built in the 70s, I think, by Blue Water Boats on the West Coast. And those are, wow. a lot of those are still going strong. Um, and, Sounds very uh, odd to make a fiberglass version of, of a wooden boat. They're... They're different. <laughs> yeah. The, the fiberglass hulls, oddly enough, ended up being heavier than the wood hulls. So <laughs> they dropped a little bit of the balance, ballast to keep the right water line. So I've never sailed on them. It's not from personal experience. But from what I've been told, um, the wooden ones actually sail significantly better than the fiberglass ones. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. I, I'm sure the fiberglass, uh, they won't take... I mean, fiberglass pretty much just, just exists, right? I mean, you... Would have to do very little to it, I guess. I would imagine uh, maintenance-wise, it's pretty good, right? 
and all boats need maintenance and honestly oh, yeah. um wooden boats are the only kinds of boats that truly want to be in water uh everything else deteriorates in water you know metals corrode fiberglass starts to deteriorate it's not it's not ideal but wood itself it gets brittle w yeah with sunlight mm -hmm. my kayak is like 15 years old and it starts cracking now like when it was new i could sit on it while it was on the beach uh, yeah. and now i can't do that anymore it would just crack yeah yeah. Huh. Meanwhile, wooden boats, I mean, the salt water basically pickles the wood and anything that goes wrong on a wooden boat, you can basically pop that piece out and put a new piece back in. Yeah, well, they're nice. infinitely repairable. <clears throat> well, that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's something we've lost in our society at the moment with, uh, you know, the quick and easy kind of way. And we've kind of gotten to a point where things are just disposable. And that's it's more or less what uh, fiberglass boats have gotten to be. Yeah, that's, yeah, well, that's true. Jeremy lives in Florida, so he's surrounded by fiberglass boats. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. That's that's what I, you know, I was like, well, what other kind of boat is there? Obviously, but these people are making a boat out of wood. That that's a, that's a new thing to me. That's, oh, I mean, dear, you'd be surprised by what you can make boats out of. <laughs> I mean, um, I'm, I'm kidding, I guess, but. Well, you were lots, asking lots about whether other ingrids were built. We were actually contacted by um, a gentleman who had built a ferro cement boat, a ferro cement ingrid, uh, out on the west coast way back in the day. <laughs> sell it around. Just why would you do that? It was a very typical way of building boats, actually, back in the day. Isn't it? Isn't it hard enough or, or easy enough already to build one out of uh, wood? Why do you need the extra challenge to make it out of concrete? Uh, actually, it's easier. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but it's didn't an, you have it, to build a whole form for it? Yeah, you, well, you got to build a form for the wooden one, more or less, anyways. You mm -hmm. got to build the molds. Um, but yeah, you build molds, you cover it in chicken wire, you tie those all together, and then you trowel on layers of concrete. <laughs> and it's they, actually much faster. Yeah, um, and they can, be, they can be because I thought the mold is just like a boat, just in verse. Huh? You would just build a form. You wouldn't really build a mold. So you would build the molds, which are basically, um, if you look at the plans of a boat, it is uh, chopped up in pieces down the boat. So kind of ah, like okay. if you were to take like a cookie cutter down the down the side of the boat and just take chunks out. So you yeah. just have like a station every, I think for us, it's every 36 inches. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, 32, I think. And then as you lay stuff over it, you're basically connecting the dots. Okay, so it's like a paper mache uh structure kind of yeah. yeah yeah and they can be incredibly tough um and fairly long lasting it really depends on the quality of the wire and the quality of the concrete mm -hmm. but eventually the salt water gets in there and the wire rusts and when the wire rusts it puts pressure on the concrete and it's like a slow motion explosion <laughs> and the whole boat just like <laughs> very slowly just falls apart just imagine being in the middle of the ocean just having your just your boat disintegrate under you <laughs> Yeah, it's, I guess it's not as fast as that. Not quite yeah, that yeah. violent, but yeah. it's the same. Like that's why we need to put maintenance on bridges because yeah, salt water comes uh, into contact with the metal. Yep, exactly. And you said you you this is one. Uh, these are plants that you can build at home. But for example, the keel. How how heavy is your keel? Uh, it is a nine thousand five hundred pound keel, plus or minus. So it's so, four and a half metric tons. So exactly. how can you even handle that or lift that up to, up to the boat? Bottle jacks, pipe rollers, we homemade winch. Build the boat on top of it. And and after that, how are you getting it on the trailer and to the water and all all of that? Uh, the trailers are actually shaped like a U, and they'll basically just back right up underneath the boat and pick it up. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So it's a specialized boat trailer. Mm -hmm. that yeah it, it's it's you, you won't build it for yourself it is some company will lend it to you i guess yeah exactly people ask us how we'll get out of the water and that's actually probably the easiest part of the project <laughs> <laughs> just because there's people that that do that so you just yeah. just pay the we'll take the money and then they'll come and yeah exactly just like we had victoria trucks here we'll do the same thing in the other direction nice yeah. So what what has been the biggest technical challenge of this whole whole build or so far for the project by far making the videos really that's absolutely 
I guess that makes sense, but it's not what I, not what I expected. Well, what's been so hard about it? Um, think about trying to do any project and stopping at every point to film exactly what you're doing and explaining what you're doing. So for us, it's kind of figuring out how to film this story, but also, I mean, a big part of our project, um, and we haven't quite mentioned this yet, but uh, our channel, Acorn Ray Arabella, is on YouTube. Uh, so we put out videos every Friday, and they're uh, usually around 20 to 30 minutes long. And for us, it's about telling the story, but also about putting out something that's a little bit more educational. Uh, yeah, when we started, you really go into detail. Yeah. Uh, for us, it was kind of about if we had found something like this when we started, it would have just made all of this so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> so part of doing this is being able to provide it to somebody else that's coming in down the line from us. Nice. And now, now at least one of you guys has some <clears throat> videography skills. Is that, is that, is that correct? Didn't when we started. Okay. I just, hmm. Yeah. That yeah just, just like us on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, so just basically, like us. When we started, um, Steve had the idea to build the boat and pitched it to me a, a long time ago. And at first I kind of laughed at him. I was like, this is, this is nuts. Like we need to have a way to pay for this. This is going to be super expensive. Um, and we didn't have the videos in mind at that point. And then a couple of years later, I was back in the U S um, and he pitched it to me again and we kind of started talking back and forth. And he said, I think I got an idea. You know, I've kind of run across these guys on YouTube that are doing sailing vlogs and, you know, what if we did the same thing, but with the boat build and we can tie in a Patreon page where people can donate money and that'll help, you know, feed the project and we can provide videos as, you know, a source of uh, kind of providing something. And so I was like, yeah, you know, I have a, I took photography as my major in college and I was like, why not? I can figure this out. I can make a video every week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little <laughs> ambitious. <laughs> well, um, I mean, so I, I was, kinda, oh, go ahead. Oh, I just kind of threw myself into it, you know, just because as Steve was learning how to build a boat, I was learning how to make videos. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure I'm sure some some skills from photography transfer over to making good videos. I would I would hope. I don't I don't know. Do if like he knows bit. how I mean, to hold a camera. Yeah, I mean, they'll help you <laughs> kind of set up a shot, but there is a big difference between a moving picture and a still picture. I, I notice a lot of your videos, um, you really go into details into minor things on the boat um, and explain them. So I, I guess you could argue that they're not really mainstream videos. They're really technical and into a certain subject that probably none of us will ever use because we won't build this boat. Um, how do you think... Uh, how does that influence uh, the, the success of your videos? Is it more a hindrance for getting new viewers to your channel because they might not know what you're talking about? Or uh, do you think actually that the deeper content makes it better in general for, for the success of your channel? I think it kind of depends on the people because we have people from all walks of life and we have people that are sailors and know about that. We have people that are boat builders, but we also have so many people watching that have zero interest in boats but are just loving just the detail of all this kind of stuff um, mm -hmm. and are just generally curious um so it's been really great to us to be able to put something out like this which yeah we do put in a lot of detail but it kind of gives you an insight into something what a project like this entails and whether you're watching for the story or whether you're watching because you're going to build your own wooden boat I, it doesn't really matter you can kind of get a little bit of both nice nice so yeah it seems like people have definitely got into it quite a bit. Was that nerve? Was that pretty nerve wracking when you guys, I guess you guys both quit your jobs and just took on this project full time or no, no, I think one of you guys was still working for a while. Right. Or, um, yeah. Uh, when Alex moved down, um, he got a job at a coffee shop and he was working full time there and I was working full time at the climbing gym. And then as the project, so the first two years, we did the project on nights, weekends, vacations, holidays. I mean, to the point where friends and family were like, are you guys okay? Like, we're worried about you. <laughs> like, you look like shit. Because um, we were, I mean, we were working full-time jobs and then coming home and working every night, all weekends, like just nonstop, like animals. Um, and part of it too is knowing that in the beginning, we weren't going to make money off of the videos but we knew that we needed to have a certain amount of stuff going out before it started gaining traction. 
Yeah. So we needed those jobs as we were doing this. Nice. Well, it's, yeah, I think yeah. probably a- some people get way. Hard. <laughs> I'm sure some people get way ambitious with it and then get discouraged. I, I would, I would imagine. Hey everybody, you'll have to excuse us. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty. You know, I know I know Germans pride themselves in everything working well all the time, but apparently, uh, you know, apparently the internet there was was down. Is that is that right, Max? Or yeah, yes, <laughs> we've let everybody down here. No, but it, it's it's fine though. It, I guess so. But <laughs> sorry about that. What, I feel like when those we kinds stop? of things are worldwide problems. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people that were listening to this, they know exactly why we stopped. I, I can't remember because it's been 10 minutes. Yeah, no, I think we were kind of, uh, well, just. I think we were talking about jobs. Oh, jobs, right. You guys quit your jobs or not? Jobs, exactly. You guys worked for. You were working yes, at the climbing we were, gym. Well, it, it was a progression. We were working full time jobs for the first two and a half years. So I. Um, I was working up in Portland, Maine, and Steve pitched the project to me, and I ended up uh, getting really interested in doing this. And we decided <laughs> that I was going to come down here, uh, just because it wasn't going to be able to, to to work for me working from up in Portland and coming down. I, so I quit my job, and I ended up getting a new job working at a uh, coffee shop down here while Steve was still working full time at the local rock climbing gym here as the head route setter. And how exactly did he pitch this to you? How did this come to be? Well, I think actually that's a that's a really good part. I think Steve should start that from the start, and we can kind of lay down the whole storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I don't know where it came from. Building a big wooden boat has just kind of always been like a tickle in the back of my brain. Um, so I grew up, on, I'm fifth generation on the farm here, and uh, it's just a small like hobby farm at this point. It used to be a dairy farm back in the day. But so I grew up mowing hay and working for the local farmers and stuff. And I spent a lot of time in these huge old barns. And I always had an appreciation that somebody went out in the woods at, you know, at that time with a two man saw and an ax and a horse and dragged these logs out and hewed them into beams and built them into barns. And then these structures stood for, you know, God, sometimes hundreds of years and uh, amazing things happened in them, you know, like things were born, things died, there were parties. Like, you know, I think if you walk into a, to an old barn like that, I, at least for me, there's, there's this feeling of like, you know, shit's gone down here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know that we, uh, we vacationed up in Maine. Um, and I would see the wooden boats and, uh, I knew that building a barn was, was difficult, but building a wooden boat and having everything curved and all of those pieces meeting so tightly together that they're watertight is like that and instrument making are probably the two holy grails of woodworking. (laughs) Um, you know, like in terms of complexity and challenge and tolerances, like they're right up there. Um, and the beauty with, with the boats is that they were mobile. So not only was this this incredible woodworking challenge, but when you were done, the thing could take you just about anywhere on the planet you wanted to go that was blue, which if you look at a map is most of the planet. <laughs> um, so and it was just always this tickle in the back of my head, like someday it would be cool too. And then it was like 2011, I think, and I was on vacation out in Cape Cod, and we had a rainy day, and I went to a used bookstore, and I ended up picking up this book called 50 Wooden Boat Plans. And that was the first time I'd ever really like looked at the different designs and the different construction techniques, and I just found it fascinating. I couldn't put it down. And at this time, I was working at the gym as the head setter, and that did not require even close to all of my brain capacity. Um so I put the extra of that into kind of learning about boats and their construction techniques and, and all of that stuff. So I just started picking up books and haunting online forums and, and just slowly putting the pieces of the puzzle together um, with no real like intention of, of doing it anytime soon. Just I, I just found it interesting. and It was always kind of a maybe someday thing. And then the real big catalyst for me was honestly, I turned 30. I'm mm-hmm. 34 now. And I took a minute and did some self-reflection and was like, all right, like, let's be optimistic and say I'm 
active and healthy to 90 years old. Like I'm a third of the way through it. Uh, I've been an adult long enough to know how the world works. I no longer need to have people tell me how, you know, the real world works. Um, I, you know, I went to school, I got a master's degree. I, I followed the career path. I, you know, I did the whole song and dance. And when I sat down and looked at it, I didn't do a lot of the things I wanted to do. I'm not on a path to do the things I want to do. Um, buried in student loan debt. Um, and kind of me personally, I felt like I had followed everybody's best intentions and it led me handcuffed into a box. And that is not where I wanted to be. Um, so I decided that come the next 30 years, I was going to do it my way, come hell or high water for better or for worse. And when I was 60 years old, I would sit down again and uh, reflect and decide whether I liked doing what I was told or I liked doing what I wanted to do. Um, and I figured for better or worse, at least I was going to own it. And, you know, I wouldn't have anybody else to blame for me doing things or not doing things or the outcome. Um, so at that point, it really became not, you know, if I'm going to build this boat, but like, when am I going to build this boat? How am I going to build this boat? And at that point, I got serendipitously given a couple of machines that I needed. And um, a friend bought a portable sawmill. And I was like, well, I've got most of the tools. I have enough of the knowledge to know that I can do this. And the gaps in my own knowledge, I know where I need to go to fill them. Um, we have the trees in the back. So the only thing stopping me really is time and money. And to me, those are pretty much the same obstacle. Like if you have time, you can use that time to make the money. And if you have the money, you can spend it so you don't have to spend the time. Um, you know, they're kind of the same challenge. So... At that point, I had sat a few friends down and I was like, look, it, none of you are super happy in your jobs. All of you would love to travel. I'm quite positive that I can build this boat um, and I would love to build this boat. And I think if we all sit down and put our heads together, we can figure out the time and money thing. And that was the first pitch with Alex and a few others. And they were all like, yeah, you're nuts. <laughs> um, so then I just you know, kept, kept working on it and figuring out how to build the boat and the time and the money. And then that led me onto YouTube doing the research. And I found the people sailing the world in their fiberglass yachts. And at that point I was like, all right, if we can kind of get a following, um, maybe we can make this happen, but I'm technologically illiterate. I, there's no way on earth I could video and edit and do all that stuff. It, I would be lost. Um, but I thought that Alex could. So I pitched it to him and we got to work. <laughs> Yeah, so actually the first time he pitched it to me, I was uh, I was overseas teaching English in Spain. So I'm originally French. I was born in Paris and traveled a lot as a kid. Um, and I lived till in, in France till I was like nine. We lived in Greece for two years. Then we moved to Maine. I lived in Colorado, Massachusetts. So I've always grown up kind of traveling, and I, I love it at this point. I mean, it's in my blood. It's what I want to do. And... When I was living in Spain, I was living in Mallorca, which is one of the Balearic Islands, where there is a ton of sailing. <laughs> and it was always something I wanted to get into, but never really had the chance. Um, and the first time Steve pitched it to me was actually when I came back for a visit to go see family, and I actually came here first. Um, and that was when I was like, dude, you're, you're nuts. There's no way. Like, how are we going to pay for this? But I still it was kind of still in the back of my head after that, like that would be such a cool project. And after a while later, you know, after leaving the Balearic Islands and moving back to France and I worked there for a little bit, did a bunch of traveling around Europe, I ended up back in Maine and was working a full-time job there. And as great as it was at the nine to five just isn't for me. Um, I, like Steve said, when he was working at the gym, it just wasn't quite using everything that I wanted. Yeah. Um, mentally wise and it was just a lot of stress a lot of work uh so when he pitched it to me again i was like all, all right like let's make this work <laughs> and as soon as he mentioned the videos i was like that's it like i i don't know how to make videos but i am absolutely 100 percent certain that if you can learn how to make a boat i can learn how to make videos nice. and so we immediately got to work and you know i I downloaded the adobe systems and got started immediately in adobe premiere pro which is 
uh, the professional programs, knowing absolutely nothing about it and just kind of banging my head against the <laughs> wall and making it work, which is cool because as you see us progressing and figuring out how to build this boat and being more confident, you can kind of see the same thing with me in video making. I mean, the beginning videos, I can't even watch them. <laughs> <laughs> But it's all about uh, you can learn everything, especially with software. Once you sit down and try to figure something out, you've got a goal and somehow you achieve it. And after that, you know how to do it. Like you can learn and any software. And I would software. go as far as saying that it's with anything. Yeah. I mean, for us, part of this project is showing people that if you have a dream, like go out and figure out how to make it happen. Um, you know, neither one of us had any idea how to either build a boat or make videos when we started. And now, I mean, look at where we are. It's mm -hmm. It's working. We're sustaining ourselves. Like it's... And you can do that with anything. It doesn't have to be building a boat or making videos. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So that's and awesome. you guys have gotten to the point now where you've actually you're actually hiring somebody, right, to help you with some of the some of the stuff. I guess is that is that correct? Yeah. So we're not we're not making much money ourselves. I mean, a lot of it just gets poured back into the project. And like we said, for the first two two and a half years, we made nothing off the project. We lost money. You know, like we said, we quit our jobs and we uh, cashed in Steve's 401k. I didn't have one. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, That's a commitment, isn't it? I, we don't I, have these yeah, in Germany, but I, 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 I hear people yeah, talk about them a lot. Yeah, we, we put all the chips on the I, table. <laughs> but it was basically like, we're going to do this no matter what. And if we had to go back and get a job and keep working nine to fives to finish the project because the videos didn't take off, like, so be it. But we were going to try and we we're going to make it as far as we nice. could. And we actually came fairly close to ditching the videos. Um, we were we were stretched really thin at one point. And uh, we were kind of trying to figure out like, okay, maybe we'll should let it go like a couple more months, see how it goes. And if it really doesn't take off, then, you know, we'll, we'll drop that idea and we'll work full-time jobs and build her on nights <laughs> and weekends. And thankfully, thankfully, it picked back up. Um, and we are where we are. But basically, I mean, our model has always been to not force feed this on anybody or make a paywall. So a big idea is to just provide the videos out there for anybody to watch. And kind of like the National Public Radio, you know, if you enjoy it and you want to support it, then you're free to do so. And if you enjoy it and don't have the money to support or you don't want to support, it's still out there for you to nice. enjoy. Um, and that's always been kind of our model. We're not we're not in it to make as much money as possible. It's you know it would be good if we can make the money to sustain ourselves. Yeah. Um, but at this point, you know, we're making what we need, and it would be you know, we could always use more sure. money. It's, yeah. it's still a little bit tight. Well, buy more clamps. But, well, yeah. well, and like you said, at this point, like we've hired people, um, and basically the idea for this was I. I couldn't keep up with the videos as well as be outside and videotape while we were working. Like it was just, I, there were not enough hours. In yeah, the day. seriously. Um, and I was, I was starting to get fried. Um, so we looked into what we could do and we found this great guy, Ben, who is now editing all the footage that I am shooting and sending to him. And it's actually been great for everybody because we get to give job a job that Ben, a job that he really enjoys doing. Um, it gives him an income and we actually pay him fairly well. Um, and it frees us to be able to go out into the boat and work on the boat. But it also means that we get more content out. So people who are watching get to see yeah, awesome. what we're doing. Well, yeah, that, you just made the case for Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess that, that's... A... And for those listening, that's how we are funded. Yeah, well, that, that's a great lead in then. I mean, as far as how do we, how do we get involved supporting you, you know, look at your... What do we do to support you guys as you as you go on your journey, continuing? I mean, the basic thing is just telling people about the project. So basically, what we're doing is, you know, we're we're a YouTube channel, so it's Acorn to Arabella, and we get a little bit of revenue from people who watch and maybe click on the ads there, and that's really just a small part of it. But if you really want to support, um, we do take donations on our website. Uh, we do have merchandise there, but then the big one is oh, Patreon. And Patreon what, what's your is, website address? Uh, Acorn to Arabella okay. com. Just make sure that's out there. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good call. <laughs> yeah, if you do a search for Acorn to Arabella, you will find us. <laughs> oh yeah, we're not very big on on 
kind of self-promoting ourselves. So <laughs> we have a little bit of a hard it's, time doing it's that. It's called Acorn to Arabella and they would like would like your money on Patreon or whatever else. <laughs> if, if, you, you, if you would like if to like, donate. If you would they, like to they'd donate. love your views. <laughs> and if you want to give them some cash, they're, they're cool but with that too. Even more, they like your money. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, the last one is Patreon. And I think that's, for us, it's a great, model and i i really respect what is going on with that it's basically a way to um to support people who are making things i mean the idea of patreon when it started was for creators who are creating things and instead of having to do a kickstarter which is one big lump sum which is almost impossible to get you can do something that's reoccurring so for us people can donate per video um and that is some an income that we can get each month and we do provide rewards for different tiers nice nice yeah, we know yeah, and- we know Patreon, of course. We've got free Patreons ourselves, and we're very mm-hmm. grateful for them. Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> definitely. Uh, we, well, you know, we, we um, if you guys want to support us, we've got a. We'll give the top five Patreons a shout out. So we got, you know, we'll give all of them a shout out this time. You know, Stephen Booker, um, old school DIY and positive waves. They're always uh, good. <laughs> definitely, definitely glad to have the support. And if anybody else wants to jump on, we're yeah happy to have you too yeah um maybe we'll make it to 50 dollars. yeah but no it, it's it's awesome that you know it's it's like it's amazing to me even even just having a few patreons it's like wow people in value our work enough to actually give us money for it that's that's an incredible that's true mm-hmm. it's almost i wouldn't say it's beyond the money itself but it's like wow that's pretty pretty amazing they think that much of us or 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 you guys too as far as far as your your boat project you know and yourselves yeah it's great to see you know the amount of support coming in for something yeah. like this and it's uh it actually leads into a great question that you had asked when the internet cut out um you had asked us what the biggest challenge was to this problem to this sub project and honestly it's the videos <laughs> <laughs> um and it's funny because for people like um you or i who are creating something like videos or podcasts it's it's amazing if you do your job well people don't realize how much work goes into it <laughs> yeah no that's, that's a good point yeah um I'm, I'm happy with our videos uh, our podcast could be better i think but <laughs> then again we're not getting paid a lot for this so <laughs> <laughs> no no I, th- I think we do a good job yeah. ho- hopefully um you know I, we've definitely oh, we do our best. definitely had some fun guests on and you know if they if they're good then the podcast is good so i think that's yeah, I always say I, I can't talk about these things with my girlfriend, so it's good I have this podcast. <laughs> yeah. It's been great for us with having the community that we've built around the project because we talk about this kind of stuff all the time and it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So I guess I guess that's uh, maybe well, a good segue. You, you, um, do you guys want to talk about what you've been working on like most recently? I mean, obviously, you've been working on a boat, but is there... Huh, that's just, what have you been doing this, this week? week? Yes. Uh, this week we've been working on fairing up the rabbit so that we can get the garboard plank installed. Okay. And if you follow that gibberish, I'll be impressed. Yeah. How much are you, are you feeding it lettuce or, um, pellets or, or what? I saw it. Yeah. Um, so the rabbit in, uh, in woodworking is a groove that another board, uh, goes into. So the rabbit on the boat is a groove that runs from the stem all the way down the boat to the stern and the planking nestles into it. And that's what makes it smooth and fair and oh, watertight. Very, very cool. Um, so we've been, we've been working on tweaking that and doing the final fairing, make sure that's all nice and smooth. Um, and then when we're done with that, we need to install the bronze hull strapping, which adds torsional rigidity to the boat. And then when that's done, we can start hanging the planks and we start with the garboard, which is the first plank on the boat down. Nice. The and so we'll, we'll see this quite intrigued by how you, so we'll, going to make this waterproof <laughs> uh with cotton really <laughs> okay that explains it then <laughs> yeah no seriously um when you plank the boat you they're an inch and a quarter thick planks um and you on the inside of the boat they fit so tight ideally that you can't see light through them and on the outside they're just a little bit open and when the hull is dry you go down and you take a caulking iron, which is just a, a wide, thin iron, and you hammer in um, happen. You're not really like really hammering um, strands of cotton. 
And what happens when you put the boat in the water is that all of the wood swells when it takes up the water and the moisture content increases. And that planking will actually close up around the cotton and the cotton will swell a little bit when it gets wet and it makes a spline between the two planks. And that's actually what makes it watertight. And it also adds an incredible amount of rigidity. So if you were to go take out the fasteners on one of the planks, when the hull is swelled up, you'd be hard pressed to pull. I mean, you'd be able to, but you'd really have to pull to get that plank to get out of there. Mm -hmm. um, because they would swell together and they would have that cotton spline in between them. And it's a very old um, style of doing it, but it's very serviceable. And one of the great things about it is it's very repairable and you can repair it when it's wet. So if we were to be in some remote corner of the world and bump into a floating log or something like that and spring a plank, with the boat that we have, we could just bring her up into a tidal mud flat and let the tide go out and refasten that plank, recock that plank with everything still wet, slap some paint on it, let the tide come back up and float back <laughs> off. Um, and you can't Sounds really like do those kind of repairs. Yeah. Yes, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> but you can't really do those kind of repairs um, on like a fiberglass boat, for example, because everything needs to be dry for you to be able to, to do the glass work and, and all that kind of stuff. Where with the wood haul, it's... I mean, you can do a lot of repairs really quick and dirty if you have to, which nice. is nice. Well, that's that's good to know. I, I guess I guess once you get the project done, then you'll have some more videos about you guys sailing the world and you know your various adventures, right? Is that the maybe that's something to look forward to? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we uh, both met up at Unity College in Maine, um, and we actually met uh, getting into rock climbing. So we've both been rock climbers for about I don't know, God, I'd say like fifteen years now, maybe. Um, and we're also super interested in getting to a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, surfing, caving, diving, whatever, you name it. So that's kind of the plan for the boat is, you know, we're building ourselves an adventure nice. vehicle. Well, that's, that sounds awesome. So, Yeah, a long story ahead of us. Yeah, absolutely. And oh, yeah. ahead of you. Oh, yeah, so the, the boat build for us is the prologue. Yeah. Like people are like, oh my God, this thing crazy, vicious thing, the boat. And we're like, no, 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 no. This is just the, the first boat, step. The boat is just the first step. Like that's... That's the, well, we'll build the boat and then we're going to go do the crazy audacious stuff. Well, that sounds crazy. When, when do you think you'll be done with the boat? Two, uh, two to 10 years. Two to 10 years. <laughs> two to ten, okay. That's a, <laughs> it's a good estimate because SV Seeker, I remember when I started watching, he's like, oh, three more years. And I finished university by now <laughs> and started yeah. my own, and worked for a company, started my own company. <laughs> Getting, getting the dirty. thing to remember with boats is there are no schedules. <laughs> whether you're building or whether you're sailing. Um, to have a schedule just doesn't work for something like this. I mean, you can if you're a production boat shop. But I mean, for us to have a schedule, one would kind of ruin the project in the way that we'd be worried about trying <clears throat> to meet that schedule. So that's less of a concern to us. We'll get her done when she's nice. done. Yeah, our big priorities are number one, building the boat as well as we can build it. Number two, enjoying that process as much as we can, because not all of the process is super fun, but enjoy it as much as we can. And three is to share that and share it as effectively as we can. So things like the overall cost of the build, the timeline for it, and all of those things fall so far down our priority list that we don't really worry about them. And do the two of you ever get into creative differences about the videos and the, the build itself? The build, not necessarily. Uh, Steve definitely has more skills on that aspect. So it's more me trying to make sure that we are doing things the right way mm -hmm. um, or trying to understand something, which I you know I'm not that far behind, but it's, it's definitely more my trying to understand it. And with the videos, it's more... Like I said, trying to strike a balance between being an educational uh, series and telling the story. Because um, if it were going to be simply an educational video, man, we could talk for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> yeah, the amount of detail we could go in would be absolutely like we're. You think we go into detail? Like we're just scratching the surface. <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, that's the biggest challenge for us is trying to figure out what and how to what to put in the videos and how to build them. Nice. And Alex and I see things oftentimes like quite differently. I have a little bit easier time looking at like the big picture and way down the road and how mm -hmm. all the giant pieces of the puzzle are going to fit together. 
And Alex is like a lot more laser focused. Um, <laughs> Much more meticulous. <laughs> yeah. So we definitely, I mean, we have arguments and see things different ways and butt heads sometimes. But at the end of the day, like I implicitly trust Alex. Like I, I trust his judgment. I know what he's talking ways. about. Um, and we've been friends for a long time. And, and anytime we have issues, we just, we sit down and we talk about it. And we're like, all right, well you know, what's, what's going on and, and we figure it out. So people watch the videos and sometimes we get comments like, you know, oh, I want to see you guys Where's the drama? drama. Like, you know, <laughs> I want to see you swearing and throwing the hammer and like show us the bad times. And we're like, really, that, that is enjoyable. there's not much of that. Yeah. I mean, when we're working out there, like if something happens and a drill bit breaks, we might be like, ah, shit. But, but that's really, that's really about it. Like, all right, well, we'll get it out. We'll get another drill bit. Like it's not the end of the world. And for like the interpersonal things with us, like figuring out the videos and, and all of that kind of stuff, what it would look like is Alex and I sitting at the dining room table across from each other being like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what we should do. We got to figure this out. <laughs> and like, you know, we might be frustrated and, and having a, a challenging time sorting it out, but we're not yelling. We're not screaming. We're not like throwing things. it would be <laughs> so unbelievably boring to watch. <laughs> mm. But I think all the reality TV shows and stuff, they just, I mean, they just ham it up so much and they make drama where there really isn't drama. And so I don't know, oh, people yeah. have seemed to have grown to expect that. Yeah. I, I watched this thing on Netflix. Uh, I think it's called Tiny House Nation. I don't know if that's the same name in in Germany as it is in, and, uh, in America. And, uh, you know, I like tiny houses. I like building stuff. So surely that must be a good show for me. And when mm -hmm. you when you fast forward through the scenes, all you see is talking heads. <laughs> you never yeah. see the building or any tools or anything like that. It's just them talking about the build for like 50 minutes. Absolutely yeah, horrible. Yeah, that's not what we want to be doing. Um, we actually, this is kind of a funny little tidbit. We got contacted by the Discovery Channel. And they weren't really asking for anything, but you could tell they were kind of nosing around trying to see if they could get in on this. Um, <laughs> and for us... I, we really weren't interested. We kind of turned them down. We were just, we were so unfriendly. <laughs> they went away. <laughs> wow. Cause for us, like we want to keep create, we want to keep creativity in our control. And we also don't want to have to deal with that drama or have a huge crew around. So it wasn't really something that we needed. And the money wasn't really something we were interested in. Jeremy was so more success. Sick. Susceptible, <laughs> susceptible to them. Susceptible, <laughs> yeah. susceptible. Yeah. No, I've actually been on the Discovery Channel. Believe it or not, um, they were uh, right on. But it was just like one episode. <laughs> and I got nothing against them. Yeah, no, they they were really nice. They just came and filmed the project I was working on, and and then they went away. They didn't pay me, so I guess I don't know. <laughs> 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 but it, it made for a great, great video and stuff. So I was I was happy with the experience. Yeah. So you know this. But, you know, people tell us all the time, like, oh, you guys should, uh, you know, find the Discovery Channel and sell it to them or get the Netflix to come here. And I, we're not interested. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, just just put it out there if the Discovery Channel is listening. I, I am still interested. Jer Jeremy yeah, asked me too. Um, <laughs> Please send me a check. Just, yeah, send me, send me a yeah. yeah. And I'm always interested in checks. I mean, I know, you know, I think like Max and I are always interested in. We're, oh, yeah. <laughs> We've probably created. more money is more tools. I, I want to be, buy a CNC. Um, oh, I, I looked at some companies here in Germany and they are two and they make CNC's like, you know, proper but little CNC's. Um, mm -hmm. But a really heavy one, it weighs like 600 kilograms, I think. And it's made from uh, reinforced. It's like epoxy resin with, uh, with uh, some ceramics. So it's like concrete, basically. Mm -hmm. not not made out of steel or anything like that and it's really well um absorbent of vibrations so it's something i'm looking forward to but it's nice. co cost about twelve thousand euros so oh, little, little chunk of change <laughs> quite an investment yeah <laughs> yeah i hope next year yeah we just got given a, a bridgeport metal lathe and a seneca or no a bridgeport milling machine and wow. a seneca falls metal lathe so old school CNC stuff, kind of. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 not computers. I, but... I learned uh, machining on a Bridgeport, and that machine was awesome. Oh, yeah, they are good yeah. machines. Well, um, well, Max, what do you? 
Do you want to talk about what you've been working on this week, Max? Now that uh, now that you've talked about that. Oh, this week, this week I have been working on my job. I haven't been making anything with my hands. Uh, I've just been working to earn some money. So nothing fancy to talk about, except that I'll be done in September with the work, and then I can focus more on YouTube again, <laughs> or, or or whatever yes, new project yes. comes up. Right? It's always it seems like it's always something new. No, no, no. This is this the is end. This is the end. This, I've got a project going on at the moment that is going to be the last project in a while. Uh, that, that sounds, that sounds Which I can't good talk and about, bad, I guess. So. So. <laughs> yeah, it, it will be good once, it's, once I'm over. Yeah. Um, and how about you, Jeremy? Well, yeah, I, I guess I've been working on a couple of projects. I guess one's semi-secret, working on something with another or a... a better known YouTuber that we've had on before. So that should be, should be pretty fun. Um, Mr. Mr. 83, I guess. And, um, oh, yeah. okay. And then another thing I've been working on is another, another strand beast. I'm calling this one, the, the clear crawler. So it's going to be kind of like one that I built before. And, um, for those that don't know, these strand beasts are like, well, my, my versions are eight legged walking vehicles. They rock kind of like tanks. And I don't know why I've been just kind of, um, yeah kind of obsessed with them for a while so it's it's you have you've you've built a few I, of them. and i always say it's the last one i'll build <laughs> but then you know this i think this one's the last one just like the last one before that and i um i started it i i said i guess i have to come up with a name and i just said strand beast six because yep i just make i just tend to make these things so <laughs> yeah and um i guess i guess um I guess we've gone over where we can find Acorn to Arabella. What, what about you, Max? Where can we find? Where can we find you? On my YouTube channel, Max Maker. I make all kinds of stuff. No. That's basically it. Or oh, on Instagram, but uh, you know, Instagram. I don't know. Maybe I stopped this whole Instagram <laughs> thing. Not sure if it's working <laughs> out. Nice. And um, yeah, I'm on YouTube too. I'm uh, Jeremy S. Cook, and same thing on Twitter, Jeremy S. Cook uh, at Jeremy S. Cook, I guess. Um, and just to just to make it super obvious, what about, you know, we'll just let you guys have the last word. Where can we find uh, Acorn to Arabella? Right on. Yeah, we have uh, all of those. So we our website is uh, acorn to arabella.com. Uh, we're on YouTube as Acorn to Arabella. Um, we have Instagram, again, at Acorn to Arabella. <laughs> and same thing on Facebook. Nice. Well, oh, and Patreon, Patreon, of course. So, yeah, definitely check them out, you know few their videos, view their Patreon, you know, if you want. Or a... Yeah, you don't view the paper, you just give money. <laughs> That's not just giving money. Well, <laughs> we would appreciate it if you engaged. Basically for us, we'd love to create as big of a com community as possible and inspire as many people I, as possible. And if you feel like supporting that, that's I, I will that's I will great. say though, Max, I'm not sure if you're entirely correct because we actually have four people listed on our Patreon, but one just has a has an eyeball on it, so I don't know what <laughs> what the deal with that is. I think they're they're watching us through there. He's sticking around for free, basically. <laughs> uh, but we pre still appreciate. We do it. absolutely. Not quite as much as those that give money, but still, thank you very much for supporting us and for listening to this in general. Because uh, it's nice to know that people are actually listening to the podcast. Yeah, or or, or automatically yeah. downloading yeah. it, never listen. You know. <laughs> no, it's, <just laughs> it's good enough good, enough good enough but you know oftentimes when i'm driving i listen to whatever i find like this uh black morning show podcast that i listen to quite frequently now from los angeles right uh, which i have no relations to yeah which is so far away it's on the other side of the earth it's i i don't know what about all these people i'm talking to but somehow it's entertaining and it makes my drive so well, there you yeah, go. You can you can sign up for that one too if you like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for being our guests, and we hope we Absolutely. see you. Thank you, guys, more for your journey. Uh, asking us to be on. Well, we're not stopping anytime soon. So yeah, it's gonna be a while. <laughs> Doesn't sound like that. <laughs> nice. Okay. Thanks, thanks guys. Bye bye. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Have a good one. Take care.